So I want to thank thank uh, everybody for joining our uh, RV NOG meetup for the our first session in 2022. So uh, very glad that you guys are able to join here in the first week. Um, we are still looking to eventually get back to our physical space. Um, and I, I think there is definitely benefits in that. Do you want to see us do that? But for now, we are still bringing you great presentations um, online, and today is no exception. And I think a lot of people, all of us know Michael, and Michael's presented for us before. And I'm very glad to have him here again today. Uh, Michael today will be presenting on upping the container game with an application platform. Uh, Michael Irvin is the lead platform architect at Virginia Tech and has been in the container space for many, many years. Most recently, he has been working on developing a common application platform to allow development teams to focus on the thing they care about most, their apps. He loves using new technologies and capabilities to lower barriers and help streamline processes while learning himself all along the way. Outside of tech, you'll most likely find him with his family of five kiddos and involved in various church activities. Thank you again for joining us. Awesome. Thanks for the intro there. And uh, I'm excited to be here with everybody and uh, to share a little bit of what I've been working on for the last uh, two years. And as uh, Tolga mentioned in the, the intro there, um, and, and as most of you know, I've been in the container space for several years now and uh, been kind of eating, thinking, drinking, sleeping containers, which is kind of a weird thing to be doing, but whatever. And uh, and so in, in many ways, this this platform, this this thing that I've been that I'll be talking about today is the culmination of all the work that I've been doing over the last several years. And 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 so I, I, we're, we're going to talk about, we'll see it, we'll dive a little behind the scenes of how it's put together and, and everything and uh, kind of reveal the, or pull back the covers a little bit and, and, and see what's behind it and uh, do some live demos and, and whatnot along the way too. So um, along the way, if you've got questions, feel free to, uh, to to throw something in chat or to stop and ask me. Um, if I don't see it right away, totally feel free to uh, ping me and say, hey, there's a question or, or whatnot too. Because sure. with all the different windows, uh, I may not see it right away. So um, with that, let's go ahead and... Uh get this shared all right okay so what we're gonna this, this is gonna kind of be the outline the first thing i, I want to talk about is again with this kind of being the, the culmination and the 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 full journey that we've been through uh, i, I want to talk a little bit about the journey and how we got to where we are um, but also to help reassure others that either haven't started the container journey or are at different stages of it. I, I just want to kind of address that real quick. We'll talk about the platform itself, what it is, what the initiative was, what we're trying to accomplish with it, uh, do a demo of it. Um, and then we're going to basically dive in and figure out how we built multi-tenancy into this thing. Um, and then talk a little bit about what the future holds a little bit. So, all right. So the, the first thing, the, the container journey. Okay, everyone's at, at different stages when it comes to container adoption. And, uh, you know, we were having a little bit of discussion beforehand. You know, some people aren't doing anything with containers. Some are just doing it for local development. Some are, um, you know, kind of all over the place. And, and that's that's perfectly fine. Um, and, and I know that some have even worked about containers yet. And, and that's okay, too. What, what I want to, to make clear from the, the very start here is what I'm going to be showing here is a, again, the end of, or not, it's not the end yet, but it's, it's the culmination of a lot of work to, to get to this point. And, you don't have to get all the way to this point in order to get benefits from containers, okay? Um, and as I've worked with teams uh, to adopt containers, there are several common steps that I see. And each step provides a lot of value. Um, and so it's, it's important to to not beat yourself up if you're you know only using it for development or you're only using it for your CI or you know whatever. Again, there's, there's, there's an entire journey, there's an entire spectrum of adoption and that's okay. Okay, um, but typically a lot of what I see is, is, is a journey something like this. Okay, the teams that maybe start with containers may say, "Well, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with building my containers locally, and I'm just gonna push them to a registry, and then instead of whatever script I had that was uh, you know deploying and starting up my application server, maybe it was a okay, copy this WAR file into a Tomcat web apps directory, or you know wh whatever process it is that you have to deploy your application, I'm gonna swap that with just a Docker run command." I'm, I'm just running it on the same host, the same machine. I haven't done anything with container orchestration or anything of that sort. I'm just simply swapping out my deployment step with a Docker run command, okay? Now, to some, they may say, wow, that, that's that's pretty primitive. And, and sure, it might be if you're looking at the whole journey of things, but there's already a huge value add here. Now your environment is well-documented because you've got a Docker file that's building your, your container image and, and your environment's reproducible. And the other big advantage is, is now, if you ever need to swap out that host, well, you don't have to worry about what's installed on the, the host. You just need another Docker engine and you can spin up your containers again. And, and so it, you're starting to get some more flexibility. And, and, the, and the, the idea here is to decouple your application from the actual machine that it's running on. Okay. 
And, and so you're already getting a lot of that value out here. Um, typically what I see is the next step is a lot of people say, well, rather than building my containers locally, let's, um, let's start building them as part of a CI uh, pipeline where, uh, you know, I'm going to push code and now the, the container images are going to be built in and then deployed from there. Um, and so just automating that. And, and what that does is it introduces containers into your pipeline and, and you can do some pretty cool stuff with that as well. Um, then the, the next part is starting to use orchestration. So that may be something simple like, okay, I'm going to use Docker Swarm, or I'm going to use HashiCorp Nomad, or um, OpenShift was mentioned earlier, or Kubernetes, um, just you know, plain Kubernetes. But the idea here is now you can use a, a system where this, this first sub bullet point using declarative state, that's really the, the true advantage that comes along with orchestration systems, is that we can simply now just declare, here's what I want to have happen, and then the system figures out how to make it a reality. And if you say, I want to have two instances of application X running and only one is running, well, the system's going to figure out how to get a second one up and running. And so it, it allows your entire system to be fully declarative. And uh, that that's a game changer. And um, those that have started with that really come to realize how powerful that is pretty quickly. You're no longer having to touch and manage machines directly, but you can kind of take a step back away from the machines and, and just simply declare them, uh, declare your desired state. And then, uh, and then I'd say that the next step is kind of build and use a platform. Um, and, and we've seen this at Virginia Tech where we've got several teams that are starting to do orchestration, but it's like everybody's having to learn the same lessons over and over. Well, can we kind of centralize that orchestration and create a platform that then others can build off of and use? Okay. So again, this is a journey. Don't, and, and development, I didn't even kind of put in this. This is mostly just running your containers, but you know, developers have their own journey and, uh, and uh, kind of steps that they use to, to get going with containers as well. Okay. So let, let's talk about the platform that we've been building here. Um, about actually just over two years ago, our CIO started a, something what he called a process improvement initiative where really anybody in the organization can propose an, an initiative. And so I thought for quite a while and I proposed an initiative that looked exactly like this slide. The initiative was to establish an organizational unit that provides application technology infrastructure and shared services for all application development teams in the division, which is our central IT organization at Virginia Tech, and then provide it as a service to all, meaning the rest of the colleges and departments around the university. Okay. And the, the outcomes that we were hoping to, to gain by this initiative were that teams would leverage a single common platform on which to run their applications, and then shared application development and deployment services will be managed by a single team. And by services, I mean things like our code repository, so like our GitLab instance, our HashiCorp vault for secrets, um, our container registries, all these different things right now are scattered across lots of different teams. And we wanted to kind of put them under one umbrella so we can start to get synergies and better integrations between the, the various services. Okay, So this was an initiative I proposed. And... Um, Somehow, I guess it, it was crazy enough to be accepted. And um, then it's kind of like, all right, who's going to lead it? Who's going to do it? And they're like, well, you're the crazy enough one to, to propose it. So good luck. <laughs> and uh, it's like, okay, so how do we do it? And well, the first thing we had to do is we had to kind of go around and convince everybody else, what is it that we're actually trying to do here? Because this is still super high level here. And one of the things that I thought of is like, we need to, we need to come up with the outcomes and value adds in more human terms. What, what are the actual value adds that we're hoping to get out of this? And and so this is, again, kind of the high level, uh, what we got. And we had you know, other documentation, but hopefully this makes sense to you. Our goal as a platform team was basically, you bring in a container, we'll run it for you. And you don't have, you know, as a platform team, we don't have to worry about the language or framework or tools or libraries or dependencies or anything else. You can bring a container, we can run it for you. And so that means that the teams that are building uh, Node.js apps, great. Build Node apps. Those that are doing Java apps, great. Those that are doing PHP apps for professors, you know, whatever, great. We don't care. You can you containerize it, we can run it for you. And that's the goal, okay? And that's really the, the, the beauty that comes with the, the container packaging model um, with all this. The, with that then, we want to allow application teams to really just focus on their apps. They don't have to worry about the infrastructure or um, how networking works or how to get their logs sent to our central logging uh, services. Basically just run your apps, build your apps, give us a container, we'll run it for you. Um, and they never have to log into machines, maintain them, patch them, all that kind of stuff. And, and so the more that they can focus on their apps, then that means that that's more time they can put towards their apps and they can then have faster iteration and deployments. And uh, we've seen that the teams that have used the, the platform, they're, they're deploying a lot more frequently than those that aren't. Um, and those that have joined and started running on the platform, we've seen their deployment um, times shrink quite significantly and they've been able to respond to the bugs and, and feature requests a lot quick, a lot more quickly. And one of the other big advantages that we have, and let me grab my laser pointer here. Ba, 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 ba. Um, to help even support this better, we, we've noticed various patterns that teams that are deploying on the, the platform have been using. And so we've said, well, rather than every team having to define their own CI templates and, or CI pipelines, we're going to create some templates 
that then everybody else can leverage. And it's kind of the, the common use case patterns. And so now a new team that is gonna start doing things on the platform, they don't have to relearn everything. They can just kind of pick up this template and now get up and going much, much faster. Um, and finally, this last point, and this is gonna be what we're gonna be talking more about throughout the rest is, we're really designing this with multi-tenancy from the start, okay? Um, we've tried other similar platforms in the past, containers as a service. We even used like the Docker Enterprise Edition from a couple of years ago, um, and they just weren't designed to be multi-tenant. Um, there weren't good safety mechanisms to make it so that, you know, tenant A and tenant B don't step on each other's toes. And so we wanted to make sure we don't have those problems as we work on uh, this platform, okay? So what it kind of looks like, and now it's, I will give a disclaimer and say, it is really hard to diagram such a complex system. So this is super, probably even 5,000 feet is, is too low. It's, it's even higher than that. Um, but so what we've got here is we've got a platform and we're using AWS for all of our cloud stuff. So um, this is a platform AWS account. And in here, we've got an EKS cluster. So we're using Kubernetes and using the EKS service. So we don't have to worry about the control plan at all. Uh, AWS manages that for us. And then within the cluster, we've got various node pools for each of the different organizational units, each of the different groups. And then within each of those um, different groups of node pools within the cluster um, are the applications, okay? Um, and I'll jump to the left here. The applications are defined using manifests that are stored in, in what we call manifest repos. And we'll, we'll talk about that more in just a minute. But teams, they, they build their applications, they push to their container images, and then they simply have to update the manifest in these manifest repo. And when they do so, that state gets automatically applied into the cluster to deploy whatever was being defined, okay? And then uh, from there, then the app can spin up and do whatever. Now, one of the things that we really wanted to do was to make this platform an easy stepping stone to other cloud services and capabilities. Because um, we recognize that, <laughs> welcome to AWS, here's your account, where do I start? Um, it's, it's, a huge, it's a huge toolbox and uh, it's very overwhelming when people get started. So what we want to do is make it more accessible by saying, we'll manage the, the running of your applications and everything. But if you want to use other things like, you know, you want to use some SQS keys for some messaging, or you want some of your own Lambda functions or whatever else you want, go get your own AWS account, which we've got processes to do that. And then your application can perform cross account role assumption, which we can automatically do for them. There's very, a very small amount of config that they have to do. And then their application can basically assume a role within this account to access the queues and, and all, the, all that other stuff. And do so even in a way that, pods running on that same node can't leverage those security tokens and everything. So it's it's done in a very safe and, and secure way. Um, and again, that, that provides a good stepping stone to other cloud services and, and, and capabilities as well. So that's at a very, very high level what it looks like, okay? Now, let's do a demo, shall we? And uh, what we're going to do here is we're actually going to play in one of these manifest repos and we're going to define a new application. Um, so just before this, I made a new tenant space that it's called RV Nug Demo, okay? And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna define a very simple application here and just see how it works. And I'm gonna show off something else that we built here, which we call our, our platform dashboard. This dashboard was something that we made ourselves because as we looked across the, the Kubernetes space, we recognize that most of the dashboards are very tailored towards those administering Kubernetes and not necessarily those that are just running applications on Kubernetes. Um, and so you'll, you'll see some aspects of it and I'll, I'll call it out as, as we're um, going through um, that they're, very conscious design choices and decisions that we made when building the dashboard. Okay, so with that, let's play, shall we? Um, I'm just gonna switch over to Chrome here, there we are. And what what we have here is just a Git repo. And again, this is one of those manifest repos. Right now it just has an empty readme file that just came with um, GitLab when, it, when we created the repo. What I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna create a new file and I'm gonna just call this my deployment.yaml. And, and if you've never done anything with Kubernetes, don't worry. Um, but what we're doing here is I'm, I'm defining a deployment that is going to run this container image. It runs on this port. We're specifying how much memory and CPU we need, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, so let's commit that change. And what I'm gonna do is we're gonna jump over to a, a dashboard and I'm gonna have to log in real quick. I probably already logged in with SSO, so it's gonna just go straight through. Still cache, yep. And let's go to RV Nug demo and let me zoom in a little bit. So what we'll see here on this dashboard first is up in the top left corner, it tells me basically what commits from our manifest repo has been applied. So we see 48B6A something something. And if we look in our repo, we'll see up here 48B6A something something. Okay, so it's it's applied our latest changes from our, our Git repo into the cluster. Um, and what we see so far is we just see a single pod that has spun up, it's been running for about 40 seconds now. And uh, here's the container image and I can click on it and view 
details about it. Um, you know, what Splunk index this is going to be sending logs. I don't have that configured right now. Um, you know, if this is going to automatically assume an IAM role, which what role will it be? And as well as, you know, details, liveness probes. Okay, this is using very little CPU right now, et cetera. So not a lot, okay? Now, this is a pod that's running. It's a web app, but we can't access it yet because we haven't defined anything else that would let us access it, um, and, and that's okay. So let, let's set this up. Let's, uh, in order to, again, if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, that's okay. In order to define basically HTTP routing rules, there's an object in Kubernetes called an ingress object. And this ingress object allows me to define rules that say, hey, any requests that go to this host name um, that match this path prefix, forward it to a service named hello world. And you'll probably recognize, well, we haven't defined a service yet. And that's OK. We'll, we'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, also, as part of this ingress object, we define our TLS rules to say um, this host name should use the TLS certificate that's found in, in this secret. Now, you'll probably also say, well, where's that secret getting populated and everything? And the answer is, well, it hasn't been populated yet. So this isn't going to work yet. And that's okay. We'll, we'll get it fixed in just a second. Okay. So let's uh, add our ingress commit. Now, if we jump over to our dashboard, we'll see here in just a second. Ba, 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 ba. All right. It's applying updates. So it's got a WebSocket connection where it's here and events going on in the cluster. And we see that the ingress, the domain has been um, defined, but it says no pods are currently connected. And I also see that up here in this red box at the top here, uh, two config issues. When I click on that, what we've got in the dashboard is it's basically a smart linter of sorts, but it's it's not just a linter. It's it's actually looking for commonly seen config issues. And so, for example, we see here ingress hello world references a service name hello world, but we couldn't find that service. Um, another ingress hello world doesn't have a certificate that matches all the defined TLS hosts. So it's saying, hey, you're specifying that you want TLS here, but we're, we're missing some config here. Um, and also, if I drill into this, um, it gives me the same information as well. Okay, and I, I clicked on the domain and path there. All right, so let, let's fix the first issue here. And again, what's what's awesome about Kubernetes is it allows us to just simply declare our state. And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare an object that says, hey, I want a certificate. It's going to an SSL certificate here. And I'm going to name the certificate just hello world. And that certificate should have this common name um, and DNS names on it. So this is all the, the, the um, TLS config here. When, when the certificate's been created, store the private key and the certificate and everything in a Kubernetes secret called hello world TLS cert, which you'll, if you remember, was what was configured in the ingress object. Okay. And then this issuer is saying, well, who's going to actually issue the certificate? And this is something that we as a platform team provide. And right now, we're just using Let's Encrypt for our uh, certificate issuance. But we're looking to use um, a higher ed service called Incommon. But there's a little bit of a, config or a little bit of support we still need from the, the central identity services team here on campus. Um, you know, maybe I'll zoom that in just a little bit more. OK. So add certificate, commit changes. And then if we jump back to the dashboard and here in just a second, we'll see those changes being applied. And what we'll see is a certificate down here that says it doesn't exist. And what we'll see is that there's a new pod that just started up and it's this cert manager Acme solver. And there's this new domain and path. And this is the, the cert manager tool that we're running as part of our platform that is watching these certificate objects and says, well, hey, you want to cert with this name on it. Well, I don't have a cert with that name on it yet, so I need to start the Acme protocol handshake in order to get that certi certificate. And in order to do that, well, it needs to start a pod to kind of uh, to complete the HTTP challenge and and set up the ingress and everything. And and so it it does the entire Acme challenge automatically for us. And then once it's done, we see that the Hello World certificate is now ready and it will expire three months from now. So at this point, just by simply declaring that certificate, I now have a, a TLS certificate that's signed and trusted by Let's Encrypt, and I just declared a couple lines of YAML, okay? 12 lines to be exact, all right? Um, and if I go back to my domain now, I see, all right, I've got the certificate, it's ready to go. We still need to configure the, the actual service um, in order to send traffic to it. Now, if, if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, again, I'm, I'm not trying to make this a full Kubernetes deep dive here, um, but a service, what it does is it exposes pods on the cluster network, okay? And it's, it's used to basically do um, service discovery. So basically we're saying, hey, ingress controller, whenever requests come here, send it to pods that are made available through this service. But right now we haven't exposed the pod through the service. So let's go back over here and let's define our service. And right now I'm doing all these as separate files. I could do them as a single file. And uh, in case you're new to Kubernetes, or not, you can do three lines and then another object underneath of it. So you can do multi multiple objects within a single file. 
Um, so in this case, I'm going to say I'm going to um, create a service named Hello World, and it's going to select all pods that have this label on it. Um, and we won't get into labels and everything, but um, scroll down. There we go. I'm going to commit my service. And what we'll see back here now is this will apply the change and the service. And now it says, hey, this, this application is now served by that pod. And if I open up that URL, dun, 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 I have an application. Okay. And this is just a really simple like to-do list application. Um, so complete presentation material, you know, whatever. I can add stuff. But you'll see that the URL is RV Nug Demo. And I don't know if this will show up through the screen share, but um, if anybody want to look at the certificate, they'd see that it was just issued within a couple minutes. So this is a truly live demo. <laughs> I didn't just you know stage it beforehand. Um, and so that that's pretty much it here. Okay. So we we provide the ability for teams to declare their resources, their um, they're manifest here, and the platform takes care of it and goes from there. Now, some of the things that we've done here, um, let me open up our source repo for our dashboard. Like I mentioned earlier, we've created um, some CI templates. And so, for example, I have a CI template here that's seven lines of GitLab CI that says, hey, extend this other template file um, and define some arguments. Okay, so here's the tenant identifier, and here's some extra build arguments when doing the Docker build. And with the, the seven lines here, what we're doing is we're, this creates a full pipeline that will build the container image and will do so in a way that that works in Kubernetes. So using uh, a basically a builder that doesn't use the Docker daemon, so it it's, um, doesn't need a privileged pod in order to, to do it. It pushes all the build caches back to a cache registry and everything. So it's basically following all the best practices. And then the deploy clones our manifest repo updates the, the, the deployment YAML and then commits and pushes that change back. So really any change that we make to this this um, repository now, if I make a change, commit it to master, it's going to, and you can see the last one um, here, was about four weeks ago, but all I had to do was push code here. And then as a development team, since I extend this uh, the CI pipeline, it builds my container image and, and deploys it automatically for me. And I don't have to think about it. And it, it just worked, okay? Um, now, of course, the Docker file can do, you know, unit testing. It can do all those different things as well, too. So I, I know that I'm testing my application. But again, what, what we're trying to do is lower the barrier of entry as much as possible um, and, and let it go from there. So maybe before I go too much farther, um, any questions so far? Maybe I'll check real quick. So um, is, is what, what part of this is, like this dashboard right here, is this all 100% custom? Did you use a library to help build it? Or is it... No, how hard was it? <laughs> Great question. So um, the dashboard was a was the fruit of working with a, a couple of our first customers or a couple of first tenants. Um, our, our very first few were Uber nerds and they were like, okay, yeah, just give me kubectl access and all I need to do is be able to, to configure my local CLI and I, I'll, I can query everything and, and I don't need a GUI. Okay. Um, and actually as part of the dashboard here, there's a little shell icon up here and I'll explain a little bit later how this is actually plugged in. But I can run these kubectl config commands. And what this does is it actually configures my local CLI um, with the, here's the, the API endpoint for this cluster. Um, here's the, the username, blah, 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 blah. And then here's the credential. Obviously, I'm not going to show that whole credential right now. Um, but if I copy and paste and run these on my local CLI, then I can use local tooling like kubectl and et cetera to, to access it. And that's exactly how we did things. We, we, we didn't have the dashboard exposed, but we had another little web app that exposed those same commands. Okay. And as we onboarded a couple of folks, we quickly realized it and we knew it was going to be the case. Not everybody's comfortable with the CLI. And, and so we needed to provide a, a way to put something visual in front of people. And so we did a little bit of exploration of what are the dashboards that are out there and you know, who, who's got them. There's a, a Kubernetes dashboard that many of you have probably seen before. Um, but what we quickly realize is most of those dashboards, and pretty much all of them, are really designed to those that are administering Kubernetes. And so you see a lot of the behind the scenes stuff of you know, persistent volume claims and custom resource definitions and a lot of these other things that, you know, if I put that in front of half of our tenants, they're just like, oh my goodness, this is too overwhelming. I don't even know where to begin. Okay. But really what we're trying to do is we're trying to present the information that matters most to them and abstract away all the other mess. And there really wasn't anything out there. So um, I kind of said, let's, let's build something. And so we started on a Tuesday. And actually, by that Friday, we had enough of a proof of concept to show off um, that, hey, this, this has some legitimacy to it. And within about another two weeks after that, for the most part, we have what you see here. Um, and so for the most part, it's pretty custom built. But we didn't actually have to do a lot. Um, and again, without getting too much into it, it's, it's a React front end. 
And what we did is we query all the resources from the Kubernetes API and basically load all that data into the front end. And then, so the front end has all the deployments and services and pods and all that information. And then it's really just a matter of GUI to figure out how do we want to present all that information? So that the most complicated part was just how do we get all the information and how do we listen to updates to that information? Um, so as the you know pods are being updated live and whatnot, how, how do we hear those events as quickly as possible? But then once we actually polling? display it, what's that? Is it uh, polling or is it using some kind nope, of- Nope, it's actually, so this this app has a has a connected web socket to, there, there's a very small proxy in place that then is basically doing kubectl watches and as and, and so it's just listen listening to events for various objects on on the api and so uh, it, it's pretty snappy and you saw how responsive it was here so yeah there's no polling it's it's pushing events directly from the kubernetes api server down to this dashboard um and it's pretty fast it's pretty awesome um and so the proxy the only reason we had to have that in place because a, a browser can only have two websocket connections open but we're wanting to listen to events from you know 15 different objects and so that proxy is basically just um aggregating all those watches down to a single connection for us. So, um, and that was a little complicated to figure out how to pull off, but. Um, Where does the proxy run? That, I'm guessing that's proxy is also your own. Uh, yep, it's server. running on the platform too, and it's right here. <laughs> um, so the the example CI file that I showed was an ex one of the things that we've really taken on as a team is as to as much of an ability as possible, any anything that we deploy so the dashboard is one, a user docs, we've got a couple other like landing page, et cetera. To as much as, as possible, we wanna be our own customers. And so that way we're, we're seeing the pain points, we're trying to find ways that we can improve our own processes, which then improve the processes for our tenants as well. So the dashboard was very much one of those where we said, all right, there's no extra privileges this thing needs. And we'll talk about why that is in, in a few minutes. Um, but this dashboard just is another app that's running on the platform. And we, we treat ourselves our own customer and let's go from there, so. All right. I have a question about, uh, for, if I'm a user who's going to use the platform, yep. uh, I, I guess I'm wondering how, uh, when do I plug into this process? Do I, am I developing my app and developing in a, in a container and then maybe pushing it out to a repository somewhere? And at some point it, I'm ready to deploy. Is that when I begin to use your, your app platform when I'm ready to deploy? Yeah. And, and that's, that's kind of how it's been working so far. Um, I will say that for the most part, those that we've onboarded so far were already in a containerized workflow. They may have already been using um, ECS for their their deployments, or they were doing their kind of own homegrown thing, or you know, directly on machines back on campus. Um, and so, for the most part, they were already building containers. We were mostly changing how you how you actually run them. Um, and so, yeah, instead of whatever steps that they were doing beforehand, ECS service updates or you know task definitions, whatever, it's hey, update manifest in this repository. Um, and so it's just a little bit of a shift of thinking there. But the the workflow you described is is pretty accurate. Yep. For, for cross-cutting concerns like I don't know, logging and security, do you do you have those sort of built-in uh, as things that they can just sort of plug into their applications, or are they building them all individually uh, as, as they as they normally yeah. would, and now they uh, just deploy the, the whole application uh, on the platform? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, I don't talk too much about logging later on, so I'll go ahead and answer that one. The security aspects and whatnot, we'll, we'll talk about. Um, so logging is is one that we wanted to hit very quickly and and, and have support from the very start. Um, so one of the things that we we do as part of the onboarding process, there are a couple of things that we need to know. Like, okay, what um, here at Virginia Tech we have an enterprise directory with groups that have you know group memberships for um, authorization for different things on campus. And so we 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 ask teams give us a, a a group name that authorizes members um, to have access to your resources um, in, in the cluster. Um, and so that's that's one of the things. Another one is the the Splunk index, which I kind of um, hinted at here. And this one doesn't have it configured, but I can you know we can look at some of the other ones. And so what we actually do, and I can pinpoint this later, but we put that in our config so that all of the applications that start up here, the the logs that come from those containers are automatically forward to that Splunk index. So in fact, they don't have to do anything. Um, it's just automatically done for them. Um, and I can I can explain a little bit how that works once we get to talk about mutations in, in a little bit. But, um, so there, there are some things that we do as kind of the onboarding process and figure out what are the configurations and, and things that we, we need to do to configure their tenant. Um, but for the most part, again, it, the, the goal is you bring a container, we run it, and the container best practices are you, you write your logs just the, the, the standard out, standard error. And so if you're doing that, we can vacuum that up, send it out, and uh, it's just automatically done for you. You don't have to think about it. One, one last question there, yep. um, Michael, I was very impressed with and how fast this worked. Uh, how are you getting those uh, uh, 
certs automatically generated. Yeah. So if, if you're not familiar with the uh, with Let's Encrypt and the Acme protocol, um, yeah. so that that's exactly what we're using. So those that aren't familiar, I'll explain it just really quickly. So as part of the Let's Encrypt and Acme protocol, it's a it's a, it's a way for any anybody really to say, hey, I want a certificate for this name. And Let's Encrypt says, okay, cool. In order for us to do uh, sign the certificate and give you a certificate, you have to prove that you have ownership over that domain, that you you, you actually have a, a reason to have a certificate for that name. And there's a couple different challenge me methods. You can do a DNS challenge where you have to create a DNS record with a random value that they give you. Um, and then there's another one that's an HTTP challenge. And the idea there being is, well, if, if you can prove that you own the web server and you can put a file with certain contents at a random location, well, you, you've proved that you've met the challenge and we, we know that you own that server. Great, here's a certificate. And of course, they're they're doing DNS um, querying on their end. And so basically, you say, "Hey, I, I want a certificate for in this case dashboard.platform.it.vtdu." I would Let's Encrypt would say, "Cool, put this, put a random file at this location, and and all the values are given by Let's Encrypt." And I say, "Okay, cool. Let me set that up." Then I tell Let's Encrypt, "Hey, this is ready now." They then query that that URL endpoint, which would mean that DNS would have to resolve to my server and everything. They see that it's there. The challenge has been validated, and uh, they issued the certificate. So that's the that's the protocol. That's the process. What's cool is the cert manager tool automates all that for us. And so what you saw is as we did that demo. Uh, let me go back to our um, when I created the certificate. We saw it, and it was very quick. So you might have to watch the recording record uh, rewind a little bit. Is you saw another pod show up that basically served as that challenge validator um, and it stored the the random value and basically just exposed that so that when the request came into the cluster um, to the that random URL location it was sent to that pod and validated the challenge and then let's encrypt said cool all right let me get the certificate and then cert manager store the the details in a kubernetes secret and it just went from there so cert manager is a fantastic tool um, here I can pull it up here um, so a pod appeared there that we don't see right now. It like briefly appeared, did yep. its job, and then disappeared. Yep. So it, it, it was there long enough to do the validation, and then it's yeah. like, I'm not here, any, I, I'm not needed anymore, and so it just went away. And so again, Cert Manager automates all that for us. And so I don't, I don't have to think about. It. And what's cool too is, and I don't remember if they do it at halfway through the mark or at what point, but when this, I want to say when it's about halfway through, through expiration, so about a month and a half from now. It'll go through that same process and get a new certificate and auto automatically renew that certificate. So, again, I just simply declared I want a certificate, and it will always ensure that I have a certificate, wow. huh. as long as you know DNS is resolving to this cluster. So, so, so what what is the cert? What is a cert manager? Is that a Kubernetes? Um... Yep, the cert manager is a. Um, I want to say yep, it's a CNCF project. Um, it's just another set of pods that are running in a cluster, and gotcha. what it does is it defines. A custom resource definition um, of certificate, and and because if I if I'm not running cert, cert manager in my cluster and I try to declare this object, the Kubernetes API is going to say, "Hey, I don't recognize this thing. Um, you can't define that." But when I deploy cert manager, it allows me to create these these certificate objects, and and this is where the real power of Kubernetes comes in because not only can you de define you know pods and services and all the default stuff that comes with Kubernetes, it's extensible, and so other components can say, well, hey, I'm going to allow my own resources to be defined. And and so it allows this object to be defined. But then Cert Manager is then watching for these objects to be created, updated, deleted, et cetera. And then it responds appropriately. So when I created this, that Cert Manager component that's running in our cluster said, hey, I just saw the certificate created, this object get created. Let me go to work. And it did its job from there. And that's the real beauty of, of Kubernetes here. It's the extensibility of it. Um, and that's also where it gets really hard to get into Kubernetes because like, wait, what extensibility things do I need in order to actually run, um, you know, run a platform or just run some applications? So, all right, follow-ups are that good? Very cool stuff. All right, so let's jump back. Um, bu -bu -bu slides, there we go. And actually, I'm gonna get a quick drink of water. So hopefully that was a pretty awesome demo. Um, let, let's talk a little bit of behind the scenes of how it's built and um, some of the various componentry that that's needed in order to, to put it together. We saw Cert Manager, but there's a lot of other things involved as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are using EKS for the, the Kubernetes control plane management, um, and so that means we don't have to manage the 
the, the master nodes or any of the etcd or database backups all that kind of stuff for the actual master nodes that's all actually completely inaccessible to us we can't uh, do anything with those nodes um, whenever anybody spins up a kubernetes cluster there are some things that you pretty much always need one of those is going to be what are you going to use for networking and there's a lot of different networking tools out there um, we decided to, to use uh, Calico for our networking, but we're actually looking to potentially switch to another, uh, it's, it's called a CNI, a container network interface, another CNI plugin called uh, Cilium, uh, because it provides a lot more observability and we can see a lot more of what's going on in the network. But um, anyways, uh, we're using traffic for ingress management. So basically what traffic does is as the requests come in, traffic is the one that's actually listening to those ingress objects. When we define the HTTP routing rule, it's the one that's receiving that request and figure out where do I actually forward this request. Um, so traffic is in charge of that. Cert Manager, we were just talking about uh, for certificate issuance and renewal. Um, and we also have Prometheus and Grafana uh, there for monitor, monitoring and observability so we can kind of keep track of our nodes and you know, file system sizes and, and just tons of metrics. In fact, I think we're well over 300,000 metrics that it collects right now. So um, there's a lot there. Um, so let's talk about how deployments are handled in the cluster. Um, so we saw a little bit of, of using these manifest repos, but let's actually talk about the componentry and how that's kind of plugged together. Um, before doing so, I wanna talk about GitOps. Um, it's in fact what we actually just did, but I wanna make sure to call it out because that, that's what we did. Um, the entire system is descri described declaratively. You know, you'll notice that when I deploy the, the pods and the deployments and certificates, I, I was not running kubectl commands. So I didn't do kubectl, um, create deployment or you know run or I, I wasn't using a CLI. I was describing it declaratively using files, okay, and and I was storing those in Git repos so I can now version those files. Um, so that means if for whatever reason we we see that hey um, you know two weeks ago we saw an application doing something spurious or whatever, but then it stopped three days later. Well, we can go back in the Git version history and find out well what container image was running at that point in time, and take a, a, a deeper look if we wanted to. Um, so everything's version controlled. What, what that also means too, is that with using Git, for teams that want a little bit more change management, we're watching the, the master, soon we'll be switching to the main branch, um, but we're watching the master branch. So teams that want a little bit more change management, they can put their own pull request review process or whatever else it is that they want in place <clears throat> to, to review changes before they get merged into their main branch and, and deploy from there. Um, and so that was one of the, the nice things for us about Git. We just say, hey, here's a repo, whatever change management process or lack thereof you want to have in front of it, that's up to you as a team to, to decide how you want to control those manifests. Um, once they're, they're in the, the main branch, the approved changes can be automatically applied to the system, which we saw um, being applied. And then software agents ensure correctness and alert. So, um, you know, we, we saw when I declared an ingress without the right service, it was telling me that this isn't right. Um, and there, there's lots of other uh, little agents that are watching for changes. So this is kind of how it works. Um, and this is again, still at a thousand foot level. Uh, in this case, I've got two different manifest repos, one for tenant A and one for tenant B, um, each with their own manifest. And then we're using a tool called Flux, which is actually the, the component that's pulling the manifest from the repository and then applying them within the, the namespaces for each of the different tenants. Okay, so as we made changes in the RVNUG demo um, repository, Flux heard that change. Uh, we have webhook notifications going in, and then Flux goes out and fetches the manifest and then actually does the apply um, in the namespace. Now, let's see. Okay, okay. All right, I couldn't remember if I had one extra slide in here. The big reason we took this approach is because what this allows us to do is it keeps all of the basically cluster credentialing that can make changes to the cluster inside the cluster. We don't have to figure out how do we distribute credentials that can make changes to the cluster. So write access, we don't have to figure out how do we securely provide them to CI templates? How do we provide them to people, whatever? Basically what this allows us to do is keep all the credentialing here. And then our manifest repos become the source of truth for the entire state of the cluster. And so if we ever, for whatever reason, had to completely burn down and rebuild a cluster, well, great, we can do that. And now just reapply all the same manifests that were there before. And we're back to the exact same state we were before. We don't have to worry about one-offs or any of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, people going in and, and mucking around, like, okay, I'm gonna change this directly with the CLI. No, that there, there's zero option. In fact, all of our tenants have read-only access to the cluster. The only way that they can make changes to any applications is through these manifest repositories. Okay, and so now we have full auditability of everything that happens um, and the change history, et cetera, um, going on in the environment, which is pretty awesome. Um, fortunately, we've never had to, to uh, tear down and rebuild the cluster, but you know, you always have to be ready for those, those scenarios as well, okay? 
Um, and again, like we were talking about earlier, Flux defines its own um, custom resources. And so through one object here, this is an example here of a, a Git repository. So this is saying, hey, watch this Git repository. Um, and we're going to we're gonna pull every 30 minutes. Uh, since we're using webhooks, this is actually a pretty um, tight window. Normally, we would actually put this like every six hours and, um, to just check for changes. It's going to watch this repository and it's going to use the SSH credentials that are found here. And that's just the SSH key, like known host config, that kind of stuff. Um, and then it's going to watch the master branch. So what this is doing is it's basically configuring this side of the, the flow of what repository am I going to watch? Okay. And then the right side here, this customization object is how do we apply the things that we just found? So this is saying, I'm going to apply the things in this source of the Git repository RVNUG demo. And I'm going to apply the, the manifest found it at the root. Um, so I'm going to prune things. So if any manifests uh, were removed, whatever, let's go to automatically prove. And I'm going to apply all the changes into the RVNUG demo namespace. And when I do so, I'm going to use a service account named Flux. And that, that provides kind of RBAC um, controls there. So what this object does is defines this right side here. Um, and it ensures that this source repo goes into that, that tenant namespace. And that's all we have to do. We just define a little bit of config. And now Flux is going to watch the repos and it's going to apply the manifest in, into that um, in that namespace. Um, and that, that's pretty much it. It's just declaring two, two objects here. And again, Flux is watching these objects getting created, updated, you know, deleted. And it reconfigures itself to now watch those different things and, and deploy the, the changes where they need to go. Um, and it, it's it's pretty awesome. We've been very happy with using Flux. Um, I've even thought about using Flux for, um, <laughs> since we were talking about Raspberry Pis earlier, um, you know, having Raspberry Pis, um, and I can run a cluster on each, okay, a cluster. I can run Kubernetes on each Pi and have the source material for what it should be running in a, in a repo. And if I take that Pi, you know, somewhere where it doesn't have Wi-Fi access, well, then it just can't sync. But then the next time it can sync, it'll, it, once I bring it, you know, back home or, you know, whatever on the Wi-Fi, it can sync and pull the latest updates, whatever. So it, it could be possible to use that for air gap kind of situations too, which I'm, I've been wanting to try. So anyways, um, and in fact, I'll, I'll take one step further. If, if anybody wants to try that, uh, K3OS, which is a kind of an OS specifically designed to run K3S, a, a streamlined version of Kubernetes, actually has custom resource definitions um, that lets you manage the patching of the underlying operating system and everything using Kubernetes objects. So you just simply update your objects to say, here are the packages I want installed, what kernel versions, all that kind of stuff. And just by declaring the new objects, there's something that's listening to that and will actually do the patching of the underlying operating system all through Kubernetes. It's, it's mind boggling. It's cool. Um, anyways. All right, so let's, let's talk a little bit about, actually, maybe before I do that, any questions so far about Flux or any of this stuff? And I can check the chat. Too. Okay. Not seeing anything yet. All right. So let's let's talk policy enforcement. Um, for the most part, what I did here was was pretty pretty easy uh, and pretty safe. Okay, but let, let's try to break something here. Um, let's go back to my ingress object here and let's let's do something I shouldn't be allowed to do. Now, I've got an ingress object here and and I'm you know I've got a well-behaved tenant who is using the domains that they're authorized to use. But now what happens if I want to say I want to take over platform.itwtu the the root. Okay. And I don't know, let's just change that. Okay. So I want to now say any request going to this domain should go to my application here. Now, obviously that's something that we shouldn't allow in a platform that each of the tenants are really only using the domains for which they're authorized, okay? Um, try to break the platform, okay? So I'm gonna commit this change. And now if I go over to the dashboard, we'll see it apply the updates. And looks like my WebSocket, okay. Once it reconnected, the latest changes failed to be applied. And if we take a look at it, it gives me a reason why it says, unauthorized host on ingress platform.it.vt.edu. Okay, so we've thought about this exact scenario in which what happens if somebody isn't well behaved or is trying to do something they shouldn't be able to do, or maybe they were just compromised or, you know, whatever. How do we prevent tenants from affecting one another? Okay, and so one of the ways that they can do that is by using bad ingress objects. Okay, um, so how do, we, how do we do that? How do we enforce things? And so that's what we're gonna talk about now. How do we prevent people from breaking out of their sandbox here? Um, in order to do that, we have to make a quick aside on how objects in Kubernetes are created and stored, you know, the API request process. So every time that we apply changes to Kubernetes, it's, it's an API call. And all the requests go through a several step process. Okay, so 
when I say, hey, apply this object, there's an HTTP handler that finds out, well, first off, is that even a valid um, URL endpoint, et cetera. There's some really basic authentication authorization that occurs, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Then there are what are called mutating mission controllers. And we'll dive more into these in a little bit. But basically what these allow us to do is to mutate the object that's being stored to make changes to them. And what it does is it um, collaborates, it sends the request to other services in the, in the cluster to say, hey, I got this request for an object. What changes do you want to make to it? And then the, that service sends back and says, all right, hey, here's my updates to it, if any. Um, and it goes through a bunch of webhooks that, that can make changes. Um, after all the mutations, then the, the object is validated against the schema. Um, you know, did it, was the original object or any of the mutations, did it break the schema uh, for that particular object? And then there are validating mission controllers that say, okay, cool, now that everything's been mutated, everything, should this thing be stored in the Kubernetes state database? Okay. And so it can, config, it can uh, collaborate with lots of other services and those services can look at different things and say, well, you know, does the namespace exist or lots of different things um, to, to validate the, the request. Um, and then every, if everything is good, then the object is actually persisted into the, the Kubernetes uh, distributed database, uh, which is etcd by default. Okay. So that's, that's the process that every object takes when it's being persisted to the Kubernetes. And if you've done Kubernetes, you've actually used these, whether you realize or not, and the, the Kubernetes uh, development team leverages these quite a, uh, quite a bit. And, and there's a lot of built-in emission controllers. Like, for example, Namespace Exist is a emission controller. It's one of these uh, validating emission controllers that if you try to create an object in a namespace that doesn't exist, this thing says, hey, that namespace doesn't exist. I'm going to deny that request. It makes it so it can't happen. Um, resource quotas allow you to define uh, resource quotas so that a namespace can't use too much CPU or memory. That's another um, emission controller. Um, you can also use security context deny. I mean, th there's just a lot of different mission controllers that come default with Kubernetes. Um, and by default, there's 17 enabled on new clusters, I think with the 1.21 release anyways. Um, that number could be out of date. I'll have to, I'll have to check on that. Um, but so with, with that, we can define our own emission controllers to, to hear of events that are, or to hear of objects that are being created and run policies and find out should this thing be allowed or not. Now, of course, you can define your own if you really want to, but I wouldn't suggest you doing that. Um, I would suggest using a, a library that already exists to do that. And uh, one that we've landed on is, uh, uses a framework called the Open Policy Agent. Um, and it's a basically a policy control system um, that can be used in a lot of different environments. But what Gatekeeper does is it wraps the engine and makes it uh, more friendly for Kubernetes. And we'll see um, how it does that in, in a minute. But uh, policies are written in a language called Rego, which I'll admit is a funky language to wrap your head around. Uh, we'll see some examples uh, of policies here in just a minute. Um, and then, yeah, I'll talk about everything else there. Um, so here's an example policy that's written in Rego. And uh, according to the Rego documentation, because I like to steal things from their marketing page to, to prove them wrong, uh, but it says authors, it allows authors to focus on what queries should return rather than how queries should be executed. In my experience, um, Rego allows authors to be confused about what the crap is going on. <laughs> and uh, and so there's, there's a lot of time that's just like, what is this thing actually doing? But once you kind of wrap your head around it, it's usually not too bad. And uh, this example policy here, the way to read Rego is basically a bunch of truth statements. So if, if the statement you're looking at is true, then execution will continue to the next one and will continue until it hits the first falsy statement, okay? And then the return here, this message, if it's defined, so if we get to the end here, then the deny will have a message and it, it'll deny. So in this case, what we're looking at is a, a, an object that's being passed in, that's a pod. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to go through that object. And if you know any, the, the pod spec anyways, we're gonna grab all the, the images from all the containers. So this is gonna iterate through all the containers, which is an array. Um, we're gonna iterate through, and we're gonna find any image that doesn't start with myregistry.com. And you can swap this out with whatever registry you're using. And if we find any images that don't start with this, we're gonna set a message that say, hey, image whatever comes from an untrusted registry. So with a policy like this, this would, if implemented, would ensure that all pods that run on the cluster come from a registry of myregistry.com. Obviously a pretty contrived example here, but it's, it's short and simple enough to kind of wrap your head around. What, what is this actually providing us here? Okay. Um, so Gatekeeper, going back to the API request um, process and workflow, it runs as a webhook emissions controller. And, and so it receives, er, it, yeah, it, it's notified of every object that gets created in the cluster. Um, and then through using various um, um, objects and whatnot, we can configure the policies that Gatekeeper is using. Um, and I won't go too much in all that, but so like, here's an example of one. This is an older version of the ingress, the, the authorized domains that we uh, were just 
that we just proved works. Um, but if we kind of go through this, so the violation is going to work on all on all ingress objects. It's going to extract all the host out of them and then basically um, validate it. And there's a couple different validations, whether it's wildcarded. So we do support wildcards on it. And uh, and it just basically figures out, was that an authorized domain? And if not, let's, let's fail it. And, uh, and what we can do is through that constraint template, we can then say, hey, this namespace has access to this domain. And that's it. And so, and this is not the exact uh, one because we also wildcard it uh, for our tenants, um, their tenant identifier dot tenants, whatever. Um, but this is pretty close. And uh, and so we make one of these for every tenant that runs applications on the platform. And so what we allow then is, all right, this is obviously a domain that we just hand out, we give the people, but if they want a, a prettier URL, great, you just tell us and we'll update your, your policy to allow you to use any other domain. Um, you know, after authorizing that they're actually allowed to use that domain. Um, and that's pretty much the process. Um, and, and we've got lots of different policies. Um, we currently define policies to do the following. So authorized domains allowed for both the certificate and ingress objects. Um, we block other things like a load balance or node port services. Um, we require container resources, CPU memory to be defined for certain tenants. Not all tenants have that, that policy applied to them. And then uh, something that's called the pod security standards we enforce the baseline standards on all of our tenants. And those baseline standards, yeah, you can read more at this link and I'll, I'll share the slides afterwards, but here are all the, the baseline uh, pod security standards. So, and for the most part, it's it's preventing, it's it's adding extra controls to prevent pods from accessing the host and doing things that they shouldn't be able to do. Um, so like preventing host path volume so they can't mount the host into a container or into their pod or running privilege pods or using the host namespaces, et cetera. So it's, it's again, kind of limiting their ability to do anything with the host uh, machine. There are other pod security standards. Maybe actually, let me open this up. And um, there's another one called privilege that basically gives you access to everything. And we don't give that to any of our tenants. That would be dangerous. Um, and restricted is the baseline plus more. And if I scroll down here, like restricted restricts what volume types you can use. Um, disallows privilege escalation within containers, requires um, containers not to run as root users. Um, and so it gets a lot more restrictive and we're not at a position to apply these universal across the board for all of our tenants because a lot of our tenants still run containers using root and, and that kind of stuff, which, you know, okay, have fun. Good luck. Um, so we just do the baseline um, standards right now. All right. Questions with policy enforcement management. I know I went through that pretty quickly, but um, questions there? No, that, that gatekeeper software it keeps ringing a bell. That that doesn't happen to be the same software from the the net movie with Sandra Bullock, does it? I haven't seen that, so I'm not sure. Really? Okay, because it was like uh, security software called the gatekeeper. Oh, cool. Spelled the same exact way. <laughs> or maybe they named it after that. I don't know. Uh -huh. but, but yeah, gatekeeper is pretty awesome, um, and and we rely on it heavily to yeah do all these additional policy enforcement. And and the thing I didn't mention is I mean Kubernetes has some pretty pretty good authorization built in, but it doesn't get granular enough. So for example, we can say, hey, tenants can't create, uh, this is an example, obviously not, so, tenants can't create pods, okay? And and so if we made that statement, then great, they wouldn't be able to, to create pods. But the authorization and in, built into Kubernetes only gets to verbs and nouns. So can you create pods? Can you update pods? Can you delete pods? Can you list pods, et cetera? But it doesn't allow you to get more granular than that. So if you want to say, yeah, you can create pods, but you can't create pods that are privileged because that now drills down into the object and, and needs a little bit more a, a little bit more policy around it. Um, the built-in Kubernetes RBAC doesn't let you do that. And so that's why you need something like Gatekeeper that can drill in a little bit more into that. So. Can you control like maybe performance or, or scale? uh in any way like you know you can't spin up more than 100 <laughs> instances of the same pod um we, we certainly could i mean yeah you can write a policy to say you know for a deployment here the the max replica count is 50 and so if i see a number more than 50 then i'm going to to you know fail that apply um you can oh. certainly do that um now the the thing that you you could pull this this off but it'd be a little bit more complicated now so if, you know me being the security person that I am too, I would say, well, cool. If I can't create something more than 50, well, what happens if I create three deployments now, each with 50, and now so I have 150 total? Um, Gatekeeper can let you do context, uh, basically inject more context in it. So you can say, well, hey, I'm going to check all the other deployments that are in this namespace and then 
you know, grab the, the total replica count across all the deployments and see if, so if, if you really wanted to do that, you could, you could do that. Um, it would just take a little bit more to write your policies if, if you're going to be kind of scanning across all of your deployments within a namespace. But yeah, it's possible. That might be a fun blog post. <laughs> but that no, seems very flexible. Yeah, it is. Um, and, but the trade off too is for when we're just basically validating against the object that we're, that, that's being manipulated there's not much overhead there but if now we're going to start querying or comparing it to other objects or now we need a lot more state and context in order to run our policies and and recognizing that gatekeeper is part of basically the 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 control plane now of in order for objects to be created updated deleted etc gatekeeper's part of that process in order for that to be as fast as possible gatekeeper is not going to go and query hey give me all the deployments it's going to do that kind of on the side and cache all that so that it can it can keep the policy enforcement as, as quick as possible. Um, and so the more that you start doing, looking at other objects or, okay, I wanna make sure that this ingress name is unique, for example. Well, now that means gatekeeper is gonna have a much higher memory overhead because it's gotta cache all that that data in order to provide that context. So uh, there's trade-offs there. But, all right, let's talk about node pool management. Um, this was something, this is actually our most recent addition to the, the cluster. Um, so why worry about node pools? And what first off, what I mean by node pools is um, at the end of the day, we've got a cluster and it has you know anywhere from one to thousands of nodes in it. We've never gotten that high, but I've heard of Kubernetes clusters that do. And um, how do we kind of partition those nodes for the different teams? And, and why do we worry about that? Um, so the, the, this slide pretty much outlines why we want to, to do node pooling. Um, reduces noisy neighbor problems. And what I mean by that is um, if I have an application that's running on you know, a node and another team is running on that same node, there, there are certain things I can control. I can control how much CPU and memory each one of them has, but there are also some things I can't control. For example, like how much disk IO they're using or how much network bandwidth they're using. So if I start having one of those applications consuming all the disk IO or all the bandwidth, whatever, that's going to negatively impact the other applications running on that same node. Um, and there's little I can do as a platform um, architect to, to change that. Okay. Um, so one of the things that we we decided as well, hey, if we're worried about noisy neighbor problems, let's put all the the you know all of the team's pods on their same nodes. And so if you're a no if you have a noisy neighbor, you're being a noisy neighbor to yourself. And so you got to fix your own problems. And and so I can't have one team potentially being a noisy neighbor to another team. They're on separate nodes, separate machines, and they're not going to impact each other. Okay. Um, it helps limit the impact of teams that don't specify resource requests and limits. So th this is something that we've learned and we anticipated was gonna be a, uh, a problem. In order to s effectively scale up and down machines, we have to specify, well, how much CPU and memory does an application need? And for the most part, up to this point, teams were just like, I, I have a VM, I'm just gonna run it and I'm, I don't really care how much it's using. And we'll just go from there. So the idea of saying, hey, now I have to actually specify requests and limits, is hard for some teams uh, that they have to kind of figure out how much should this app use, and uh, and so that that's been something new. For some teams, they've they've just been like, well, we don't know yet, and so what we want to do is we want to start even with e either with an astronomically high value, or let's just not set it and observe it for a little while, so we can kind of get an idea of what should our our base metric be, and then let's set our requests and limits around that. Um, but what that ends up causing is, well, if you have fifty applications that don't have resource requests and limits. The, the Kubernetes scheduler doesn't know how to schedule them. And so imagine if all 50 ended up on the same node and now you've got you know 10 of those 50 that want to use a ton of RAM, well, that's going to start negatively impacting each other. Um, and so again, if, if you know, and that's a very real problem that we've run into. Now, again, they're only affecting their own team's um, performance there. Uh, the final piece that we, we, we landed on with the, the node pools is uh, cost accounting. Um, since we're using AWS, we can spin up each of the machines and put um, tags on those machines, uh, AWS um, tags. And if we use certain tags that we've configured as cost allocation tags, then we can say how much is um, team A's nodes costing, how much are team B's nodes costing. And while at this point we're not doing um, charge back to the uh, organizations, we at least have an idea of how much is each organization costing us right now. And uh, and that, that's super helpful information to our CIO and others of just kind of who else, who's running things and how much are they costing us, et cetera. Okay. Um, so this is kind of the slide that we had back before, what it kind of looks like. And so we have different groups of, of nodes here and uh, a single group can run multiple tenants. So for example, this group that may be an organization, so for example, in INS, uh, they're running multiple applications. And so they may want to run all theirs still in the same node pool, um, but still separate tenants. Um, so they have different namespaces for each of the different applications, 
but they still run on the same underlying nodes. Um, and so, yeah, we can support as many node pools as we want. Um, for anybody that's that's done anything with uh, Kubernetes and kind of auto scaling and nodes and you know just managing node pools and whatnot, um, the de facto tool up until about a couple about two months ago was a tool called Cluster Auto Scaler. And what it would do is it would kind of automatically scale up and down um, the the node pools. And what was uh, it, it it worked, but there were a lot of trade offs and caveats to it. Um, the, the cluster auto scaler scaled up and down using AWS auto scaling groups, so ASGs, which meant you had to had to define them ahead of time somewhere, um, but also came with a lot of limitations. So when the cluster auto scaler recognized, hey, we need another node here, it would have to go to the, it would first have to figure out which auto scaling group needs to be updated, would then have to update it, then you'd have to wait for the auto scaling group to actually spin up a new node, then you'd have to wait for the node to actually join the cluster. So there was a multi step process there, and sometimes updating ASGs take a little while for a new instance to show up. Okay, um, so back at reInvent in uh, November, AWS announced a, a new tool that they, they've been working on it for quite a while now, um, but they just announced that it's uh, generally available and, and ready for production usage um, called Carpenter. And um, what it does is it says, well, forget the auto scaling groups. We're going to basically move all the scaling inside the cluster. So now when Carpenter recognizes it needs a new node, it doesn't use an ASG. It just simply says, hey, I'm going to go spin up a new node. And, and so it's just creating instances on the fly. Um, which means that it's much, much, much faster spinning up the new nodes and getting them joined to the cluster, where the auto scaling or the, the old cluster auto scaler would take on the order of four to five minutes to add a new node. Um, Carpenter usually has them up within about 45 seconds, uh, 45 to 60 seconds. So it's it's much faster, um, and we're able to, to respond to needs much quicker. But it's also a lot more flexible. Um, anybody that's that's used cluster auto scaler before, if you're using volumes that are tied to a specific availability zone. Well, that means that you have to make auto scaling groups that are specific to those availability zones, which in many ways kind of breaks the point of auto scaling groups or whatever. Um, and so if you don't do that, a new node that's spun up through an auto scaling group, you're not guaranteed what subnet or what availability zone that new node will spin up in. And if it spins up in the wrong one, well, then you can't attach your your AZ specific volume, your, your data to it. Um, but Carpenter is smart enough to know, well, I can control that and I'm going to spin up the node in the right subnet um, to make sure that the the volume is is accessible and, and can be attached. Um, so it, it's it's pretty awesome. Um, so it's incredibly flexible, incredibly fast, but still quite new. And uh, we've we've run into a couple of things that hey, we need support for this or that. And uh, we've actually contributed quite a bit back to the, the project already, um, which has been pretty awesome to to see. And and so we're using it. So right now we've got a mixture. Some of our nodes are still using Cluster Autoscaler. Some of them are still are have been switched over to Carpenter. Um, but the other big advantage is, is now we can define all of our um, node pools using other Kubernetes objects. So this is an example. Um, I didn't actually use this for the demo, but this would be an example one if I wanted to make a, um, a node pool specifically for this RV Nug demo. Um, so I'd create a, a provisioner object that configures Carpenter and say, hey, I'm going to taint all the nodes. If you're not familiar with taints, I'm, I'm not going to get too much into it, but basically means that pods won't accidentally get scheduled here unless they specifically tolerate this. So pods have to specifically be annotated to say, I'm going to run on this node pool. Um, I'm going to rotate the nodes after a week, which is a new feature of, that Carpenter has over the cluster auto scale. So I can automatically rotate my nodes once a week. Um, uh, five minutes after the last pod is, is removed from it, go ahead and just tear down this node so I can set that TTL. Um, some labels to put on it, some other configuration. And then here are the, the tags that we apply to the node itself. Um, so again, we just simply declare an object, and now we've got the ability to spin up a, a new node pool for this thing. Now, earlier we talked about how Gatekeeper can validate objects, but Gatekeeper can also mutate objects. Um, so if you remember as part of the API request process, we can actually mutate objects as they're being defined. And so what this assign object does, it says, hey, all pods that are in this namespace, I want you to set the node selector on the pod spec to have this value. And so what this does is it ensures that all pods that that get launched in this namespace will be running on nodes that have um, this label on it, which is what we defined here. Okay, so all the nodes that spin up by that Carpenter spins up have this label on it, and uh, the node selector this this assign forces all the pods within that namespace um, to to run on on the nodes. Now we put a toleration on here, or sorry, a taint to say that pods can't accidentally be scheduled here. So in order for pods to be scheduled. We also have to have one other assignment that sets a toleration to say, yeah, this this thing tolerates that taint and, and is allowed to, to run on it. Okay, um, 
So what this effectively does is as a platform team, we we configure the node pools and then we define these assign objects to, that forces all the pods within that tenant to run um, on these nodes. And they have zero ability to, to break out of it. And, and so they, they can't run on somebody else's node pools or whatever, and it it puts them in the right place. Uh, and again, that's that's some of the power of the mutation. We talked earlier about um, logging. Well, we've got another assign object that we um, assign metadata that adds additional um, additional metadata to the pods, additional annotations that our logging subsystem picks up and says, okay, cool. If this pod has this label or this annotation on it, I'm going to send the log messages to this Splunk index, whatever. And so it's it's another assign here, another mutation that occurs to make sure the log messages end up in the right place. Okay. Um, all right. Let me stop there for a second. Any questions node pool wise? I know I'm just going through a ton of stuff here and, and I think that's that's okay. It's a little fire hose treatment, but yeah, feel free to ask anything. Yeah, I got a question. Mm -hmm. why, why do you need to rotate your nodes every week? That's a good question. Um, the cool thing about Carpenter yeah. is that you'll notice here, I don't really specify what machine image I should use. So by default, it's using a EKS optimized machine image that AWS produces, tests, validates, and, and makes sure that works with their clustered environments. Okay. So what's cool is if they if there's a vulnerability in Kubelet or anything in that machine image, um, once AWS produces a, a new machine image, if I have my nodes rotating automatically once a week, I know that from a new machine image being published, I know that within a week, all of my node pools will be rotated and will be running that latest machine image. And I don't have to think about it and care about it or, or, or anything like that. Um, so that's, it's always, very cool. that's, it's, that's very cool. Yeah, so it's always going to be updated. Now, not every team wants this. And, and this is actually some of the feedback that we have um, back to the Carpenter team. Um, because, for example, you don't know when this rotation, when this TTL is going to hit. Is it going to hit at you know, 3 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the afternoon when everybody's trying to hit the, the application? And maybe it's a, a you know an application that isn't stateless and you know needs to be up and running during business hours, whatever. Um, so one of the things that we're talking with them is it'd be nice if there was some sort of configuration here to say, hey, go ahead and mark it expired once the week hits, but don't actually rotate or you know delete the the instances until you know configuration. Maybe maybe there's a cron expression to say, okay, evaluate all the expired or actually rotate the nodes at from three to five a.m. or you know something like that. So that's something that we're working with the carpenter team of. We'd like a little bit more control over how that rotation occurs, but. Um, or maybe you know, make sure to spin up a new node before you remove the old node, so that way when the pods um, drain out of the node, that they are, they already have another node that they can jump right into. So, um, so yeah, it, it is pretty awesome, but there's still a little bit of a uh, work to be done there to, to meet all the use cases. Well, I mean, yeah, the other thing is like, is it? It's not trying to restart all the nodes at once, is it now, or is it? No, so so this TTL is going to be per node. Um, so oh, unless okay. you unless Depends you launch all. Yep. So as, uh, unless you launch all nodes at the exact same second, then no. Um, and so, yeah, Carpenter, what it's going to be doing is, you know, the first time I, I deploy a pod, it, it won't be able to be scheduled. And, and Carpenter will see, hey, this thing can't be scheduled. Let me find the right provisioner. Let me spin up a new node for it. Now it can be scheduled and go from there. And it will be happy working with that. Once that, that node is filled up and another pod needs to be run but can't be scheduled, well, then Carpenter will spin up another node. So it, it'll scale out. And you can actually put limits to say, okay, I only want to, you know, limit this node pool to a thousand CPUs or you know whatever, um, and it will scale up to that. So that TTL is per node within the pool that it that it spins up. Yep. And and you don't have to define that. So for the teams that are a little reluctant for that, we we just don't define that for them. Um, we still do the seconds after empty. So if a node um, no longer has workloads running on it and it's been basically empty for five minutes or whatever, um, go ahead and automatically remove it. So yeah, Carpenter's yeah. pretty awesome. It's it's still pretty new, but it's it, it's got some pretty neat features there. Um, I heard somebody else just about to jump in. I was gonna say it seems like they're kind of it kind of opens up the opportunity for untested changes to be introduced into your node, and then you could have problems as a result. I mean, it, most people, most groups seem to test new OSs and new you know if they go from Java fifteen to fourteen or, or sixteen or whatever they want to test that first. Yep. So I mean, I would think that there would be some people that would say, no, 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 no. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, you you bring up a good point here. So, so Java changes, 
if, if somebody's going from Java 14 to 15 or, you know, whatever, um, that's going to be testing that needs to be done within their container image um, because that, that has nothing to do with the host, um, the, the host image itself. That's going to be testing that that application team needs to do in order to validate that any changes to their containerized environment doesn't break their application. Now, for the, the nodes themselves, yeah, there, there's a little bit of risk here that AWS publishes an EKS optimized AMI that that breaks something. Um, and that's something that we'd, we'd have to think about. And, you know, do we want to, um, you know, is that something that we want to automatically allow or not? And um, and so one of the things that we, you know, we could prevent that for teams that are that are cautious about that. Um, but again, that, that this is another cool thing too, is that this could be a, an option that is node pool specific. So for example, we've got some teams that are that are cautious about that. And, and so we'll say, hey, we're not gonna automatically rotate your nodes. But then maybe for our, our central platform stuff where we're kind of dog fooding our own processes, sure, we'll let it happen. And then we'll know very quickly that, hey, a, a new AMI that uh, a new machine image broke our processes. And so let's go ahead and roll that back uh, because that's something we're, we're watching really closely and, and would be able to detect. Um, but the other advantage with the using the EKS optimized AMIs, AWS has a pretty thorough um, testing infrastructure for all those uh, um, those images. They're they're published EKS optimized AMIs. Um, so while, while I don't want to you know just go in complete blind faith or, or whatnot, they they do their due diligence um, there as well too. But it is still a risk. So yep. But you do have rollback. You just said you have rollback capability. All right. Well, that's yep. Cool. So yeah, we, we could say, hey, yeah, don't use the latest optimized AMI rollback to, uh, you know, use this specific machine um, image and, and go from there. So. And what were yep. you saying about Splunk? Um, so yeah, we, that that's part of the logging subsystem. And so we we can automatically basically vacuum up all the logs uh, from the applications and, and send them off to the right indexes and, and Splunk for that team. That's a yep. name. Yep. Um, all right, let's keep cruising here. We got about 20 minutes left and um, we should be good. And, uh, and identity access is at times something that's very complicated, very difficult, but actually it ended up being pretty easy for us to, to pull off. Um, so as we talked about earlier, Kubernetes is pretty robust support for authorization, but it has zero support for authentication. Um, so it really has no way to authenticate people. And that's because, well, there's so many different ways to use LDAP or to use OADC or OAuth or um, CAS or Shibboleth or you know, Kerberos. There's, there's so many different ways to authenticate people that they just said, we're not going to get in that game, but we'll provide a mechanism so that you can run your own little authentication service and then impersonate the request. And basically you do the authentication and then pass the, the authenticated request um, down to the, the Kubernetes API. And so that's what this is saying. You can run a small API proxy service that authenticates the user and then impersonates. And that impersonation passes along the user's name and any group memberships, et cetera, okay? Um, and so this is basically what we've got deployed. Uh, the Kubernetes API, um, if you actually looked at the URL that um, was in the dashboard with the, the kubectl config commands that we were looking at earlier, that's actually pointing to a proxy that sits in front of the API, okay? And, and so what that proxy does is it validates our these OIDC credentials that were um, issued by another subsystem called DEX. DEX is just a federated, federated IDP, and there's a lot of those, a lot of them out there. A key cloak is another one that, that's pretty commonly seen and used. Um, but DEX just simply issues issues a OIDC or um, OAuth tokens. Um, and so DEX, since it's federated, it actually um, is a client to our, our central VT gateway service. It's just an OAuth uh, service. So when I open up the dashboard, what happened was that the, the dashboard sent me to DEX, which just invisibly sent me um, directly to the gateway, sent me back. DEX issued a, a credential to the dashboard for myself, the user. And then as I'm making requests and, and finding out what pods and all that kind of stuff, the dashboard is just basically forwarding the, the credentials it got from DEX to the proxy. What that means for, for us in our, um, in our dashboard is our, our dashboard is completely unauthenticated. Our dashboard has no admin rights, has no capabilities to do anything. In fact, everything that you're seeing and that we saw in the dashboard earlier was using my own personal credentials. It's just kind of proxying through the dashboard. And so there's zero ability for the dashboard to show me something I'm not actually authorized to see, which is pretty cool. Um, so this QIDC proxy validates the, the, the token and then extracts the users and groups and forwards it to the underlying API. And then um, from there, we use kind of just the built-in Kubernetes mechanisms, role bindings, um, to say, okay, in this example, any user that's in this platform demos that RV Nug demo group. So we'd have to put you know specific people in that group here in our identity system on campus. 
any users in that group would be authorized to have this role, the platform tenant role within this namespace. And that role just gives read only access to almost everything in, in the, the namespace. And uh, that's pretty much what we do. So as we talked earlier, you know, part of that onboarding process is, well, what's what ed group, what group are we going to authorize to have read only access to your And then once that's defined, then the next time a request is made to the underlying API, it'll say, yep, you're in that group and you have access to those, those resources. And it all just works. And then again, it's tied all back to our Virginia Tech identity system. So if anybody were to leave the university or you know, be taken off a team or whatever, once they're taken off the team, they lose access to all those resources in the cluster, which is pretty awesome. Um, all right, so I want to just take a minute and talk about where we want to go from here. I mean, we, we've seen a lot of stuff and I know you've seen a lot of behind the scenes stuff and I know it's been very much a fire hose treatment here. Um, but for the most part, yeah, we, we can host applications, we can run them, we can monitor them, we can you know send logs off to the right places. Um, but this is still just a start um, because just running applications is cool. But now what else can we do with this platform now that we know that it's it's here and people are starting to use it? Um, one of the things I'm actively looking into, and I've actually been collaborating with some folks, um, even including Solomon Hikes, who was one of the original co-founders of Docker. Um, we've been talking about the, these ideas of uh, software bill of materials. And um, basically what an SBOM is, is it outlines it. It's, it's either in JSON or XML. Um, and it outlines everything that's, that's in a piece of software. Um, in, in our case, we're doing containers. So everything that's in the container image, everything from installed packages um, that's directly in the container to maybe what are all the Java dependencies and jar dependencies, et cetera. And it, it can even extend to what, what things were used to build this, um, this application. So it, it, it can be pretty extensive and uh, it's exciting to see this, this come about because I mean, build these bills of material, bill of materials, where's the plural bill of materials. Yeah, whatever. Uh, these objects, um, you know, they're, they're very commonly seen in the manufacturing world. So if, a, if something has a defect in it, they can trace exactly where it came from and, and all that kind of stuff. But now we're starting to finally see these S bombs show up in the software world. Cyclone DX and um, speed, speed I think is how they say that um, are basically the two largest implementations. One of them is more industry driven while the other one is more government driven. Um, but the idea here being is that eventually we'd like to plug this in more of the CI pipeline and, and move a little bit more leftward in the deployment process. But it would be awesome is, you know, we as a platform, every time a pod starts up, we look to see, well, hey, have we already scanned that pod before? And let's generate an SBOM for it. Okay. And there's there's tools that already exist for this um, out there. So let, let's let's uh, generate an SBOM. Let's store that SBOM in a maybe a graph database or you know some sort of database. And so when vulnerabilities or issues come out, you know, for, for example, the log for J1 that just hit you know a couple of weeks ago, then we can say, well, hey, across our entire fleet, across our entire platform, what applications have this exact dependency in it and, and the specific version? And then we can notify the teams immediately and say, hey, these particular ones are vulnerable, or we can put additional controls in place for those uh, particular um, um, applications, maybe network policies to prevent uh, external uh, egress traffic from that namespace for a period of time to, to certain domains. Or, you know, we, there's a lot of things that we can do um, to kind of tighten and, and lock down those particular applications. Um, and so there, there's a lot of really cool things we can do with these SBOMs. And I think we're just starting to, to see them. So um, if you're interested in that space, let me know, because I'd, I'd be happy to chat more about it too. Um, another thing that we want to do is uh, some active security scanning. Um, for the most part, we at Virginia Tech are, are pretty good at logging and monitoring. So when when something happens, we can trace and figure out where how did it happen and you know what was the impact, where, where did they go from there. But I would say for the most part, most of our applications are not actively monitoring in the sense of do we detect something right away. Um, a lot of it's passive, and I, I'd say that's not the case for like our ERP finance systems, students, you know, all that kind of stuff. But many of our other applications, it's very passive. Um, but using tools like Falco. Um, and eBPF is extended Berkeley packet filter. Uh, we can monitor kernel level events. And so, for example, if an application reads its secrets files, um, its certificates, et cetera, at startup, we could we could put a rule in place that say, hey, when a file handler opens for the secrets file more than five minutes after startup, notify us, let us know, because that's unexpected um, behavior there. Or hey, if we're getting um, network requests that are outside of the Virginia Tech IP space, you know, maybe um, to Tor endpoints or um, you know China or Russia, you know unexpected locations. Notify us and let us know um, right away. Um, that's another reason that we're looking at Cilium because we can have a lot more observability of what's going on in the network space. But it was so Falco can really monitor any kernel level events um, and and do some pretty neat stuff with it too. And so we're we're looking to 
figure out one, how can we plug that in, but also two, how can we give the application teams a little bit more control over the policies that, that are being applied there? And um, so that they can better secure and lock down their, their applications as well. So um, that's another area we want to look at. And with that, um, I'll recap and then we'll just kind of open up for questions and I'm happy to hang around for a little bit. So um, if you want to learn more, feel free to reach out to me anytime. Um, here's my email address. I'm pretty active on Twitter as well too. So and I've got my DMs open. So feel free to send me a message there if you want. Um, we do have some user docs. They're, they're still evolving and I'm actually working right now to put some more architecture um, documents on that site. But uh, docs.platform.it.vt.edu is the place where we have that. And so we've got some kind of getting started guides and various use cases of, okay, how can I add persistent storage to my pods and that kind of stuff. And uh, I actually just published a blog post today on uh, my personal blog. It's, I called it kind of the, the four tenants of multi-tenancy, um, which I talked about some of it here and dive a little bit deeper on it. So with that, thanks. And uh, any questions? I know, again, I know I fully recognize there's a lot of material, um, but happy to go over any of it again or dive deeper on the stuff or do demos or whatever it is you guys want to do. So you said you were logging stuff like unusual activity. Um, does, does this Kubernetes have a network intrusion detection system like uh, a normal network? So not so Kubernetes doesn't by default, but that's something that Falco combined with some of the Cilium or um, and the other network components that we're we're looking to plug into it. They at least give the hooks in order for us to be able to do some of that kind of stuff. So it doesn't exist today, but it is something that we're we're looking at doing in the future. I mean, I guess at the end of the day, too, you can always run you know things like Snort and other kind of traditional um, IDS systems directly on the nodes as well, too. But yeah, we're we're not currently doing that. So is this, um, these nodes that you were talking about, the isolatium, does that kind of facilitate groups having a tier, three tiers, separate tiers? Or... Yeah, and that's actually a good good question. Maybe I'll stop sharing for right now. There we go. Okay, I'll just go back to my face. Um, so I, that's one of the things I, I didn't do too much. Um, that, um, you know, what? how do we actually define tenant? <laughs> um, tenant is a very loose term in our context anyways. Um, some teams have decided that they, they want different tenants for each application they're doing. Um, some teams have said, well, we want even a, a different tenant for each environment of an application. So they're using you know, a, a dev and a prod um, tenant. And some other teams have even said, well, we're just, we just want a development and a pre-prod and prod for all of our applications. So they're gonna put all of their development stuff in one, all their pre-prod stuff in another tenant and all their prod. So to us, we don't really care. It's, it's more of the, how does the, how do the application teams want to manage their deployments? And uh, I mean, there, there's trade-offs to, to breaking things up smaller. There, I mean, there's it's more potentially more repos you're having to maintain, but it's also a little bit more security boundary between them. So it, it just depends on what the team's needs are. Yeah, I know you're more technical than financial, but I mean, does it cost more to have a node per app than it does to have a node per tier? Yeah, so, and that was actually part of the discussion when we had with how do we design our node pool setup? Um, do we just kind of have general pools for everything? And then as we did more research, okay, yeah, that's, that's you know, we get additional security boundaries. But yeah, I, I, when you start saying, all right, I want a node per app, imagine if you have 100 apps, and now that means you have 100 nodes, and each of those applications, at least for most of our applications on campus, most of our machines are sitting very well underutilized. And, and so there's a lot of additional that, in fact, uh, it's been a couple of years, but I, I talked to one of our sysadmins and, and she said that um, across her, the fleet of machines that, that she did, she managed, she said that the average utilization on the machines was maybe about 20%. And, and that was, I think about 300, 300 machines at the time. And so all right, that means out of the 300 machines, really only 20% of the CPU, 20% uh, of the, the, that fleet is used at any point in time. And that's a lot of overhead. Um, and so one of the advantages that we can have with clustered environments is rather than doing a node per app, now we can start to put multiple apps on the same nodes. But again, there's trade-offs. Um, you know, do, do you want to have larger nodes with more apps on them that could potentially you know, be noisy neighbors and, and cause trouble with others? Or you know, which can be limited if you set proper CPU and memory constraints around those? Or do you just say, well, forget it, we'll just do an app per node. So there's there's trade-offs. And in many ways, that's why we did the node pool um, designation that we do now. So for teams that want to have you know, an app per node, they can certainly do so. But now we've got the co cost accounting to kind of point to it and say, hey, yeah, this, this group is costing more because of the decisions that they've made for it. Um, 
in so many ways, we're kind of still leaving that up to the teams um, at, at this point. Yeah, I imagine that's this supervisor's going, I just want the best and then we can we can grow into it. Um, and that someday never comes. <laughs> yeah. And and so actually, I mean, for the most part right now, most teams I'm trying to think if we have any exceptions. Is pretty much all the teams that we have right now, actually, none of our teams are doing a, an app per node. Um, and even in the, the teams that I interact with that aren't even using the platform, they're already running multiple apps on the same VM, same machines. Um, so it's, it wouldn't be a new concept to them to um, now have to basically bin pack more applications on the same nodes. So, How many customers do you have at the time? So right now, all of our IT security office, so all of their production applications are running on, on the platform. Um, Brad Tilly, who's in the, I don't remember his official title. If he, I don't know if it's director of the security lab, but whatever. He uh, he purposely said, I, I want to make sure that anytime that you display numbers of how many applications, uh, different units are using, we're number one. And so he's made it his goal to kind of always be at the top of the list. And you know, having the security office at the top of the list for a platform is never a bad thing. Um, and so they, they've been a, a big, uh, a valuable, um, Asset. And then we've got um, NINS who's doing a lot and they're actually doing all their development and feature branch based deployments and everything on the platform. And at any point in time, actually, I'm kind of curious. Let me check. They currently have in their developments here, they have 54 pods running right now uh, for just various feature branches that they've, they've got running. So um, they do a lot of their development utilizing the platform as well too. Um, and then we've got a couple other teams that are doing things. We just ran a workshop. Um, actually, it was the first week in November and just left the resources available so that others can do it. And we had 35 um, different individuals from around campus kind of do the workshop and deploy applications and test things out. And that was good, valuable feedback for us as well, too. So um, so right now, the, the, the number of teams is still low. Um, and I would say, actually, there's one other group that's experimenting that would move basically all the static assets from our Virginia Tech CMS onto the platform. So that would even mean like vt.edu would be served by the platform. And that would actually bring like seven, 700 websites over. Yeah, that'd be almost a thousand. Yep. So that would be a pretty big one. And so we're doing some experiments to figure out how to properly cache all those assets and, and everything too. So there's a lot of ephemeral storage that would be needed for that. But so still early days, but we're, we're having a lot of uh, good fun with it. So Henry, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Sorry, I was just responding to the chat message in case everybody wondered why I just shouted him out there. Uh, but all right, seven fifty eight. Any last question? Well, I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Really appreciate you coming and showing us what you've been working on. And it seems like you've been working on a lot of this. <laughs> so this is a huge, huge thing, and it's very impressive. I'm very impressed with uh, what you're able to. Basically, you built out. Most of the capabilities um, we have, uh, we're using um, OpenShift, but it's a yep. huge platform to enable the you know usage of Kubernetes without having to you know all of the underlying uh, workings. Uh, but you replicated pretty much everything, all the benefits that I see us having with OpenShift in your own environment. Using free open source. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate you coming and showing us uh, what you've got. Um, this was a very um educational um session for me so thank you very much sure thank, uh, thanks for having me join us next month uh the first thursday of the month that will be on february 3rd for our next session i uh, hope to see all of you guys then until then keep keep learning